here, so that's good. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started today. Thank you so much everyone for being here. My name is Ashley Denninger and I'm the Manager of Consumer Programs and Digital Marketing for the Ohio Beef Council. And we're really excited to bring you all this virtual farm tour today at Maplecrest Farms um, with John Grimes in Hillsboro, Ohio. So we're gonna dive deep into kind of what genetics are, how that helps his herd and his family's operations. So if you have any questions at all throughout, um, if you're watching via Zoom, feel free to put them in the Q&A box at the bottom and we'll try to answer those as quickly as we can as they pertain to the conversation. And the same goes to those watching via YouTube. You know, Feel free to leave a comment and we'll see those and we'll try to get them answered. So with that, um, Let's get started. So we're gonna go ahead and pass it off to John Grimes at Maplecrest Farms. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to visit with you today on a beautiful day here in uh, Highland County. As Ashley said, my name is John Grimes. Uh, this, we are at uh, Maplecrest Farms, our family farm operation. It's owned by uh, my wife, Joni and I, and our family members. We have two daughters, uh, Lindsay, uh, is uh, married to Adam Hall and they have a son, Holden, uh, that's gonna be a part of the operation, I'm sure one of these days. And our youngest daughter, Lauren, who is ma married to Will Core, and they're expecting their uh, first coming up this fall later. So uh, it's very much a family operation. Uh, we uh, have grown the herd over the years. Today, we're up to about 325 cows uh, that are primarily Angus. Uh, we do have some uh, Simmental cross cows and some other commercial cows as well. The goal of this operation is to raise breeding stock uh, for, for other fellow cattlemen across the country. And ultimately what our goal is, is to provide genetics that will ultimately uh, produce high quality beef for consumers. Uh, since we mentioned consumers, I think beef producers today definitely take that more serious, what the concerns are of uh, consumers that obviously they want to know more about how our beef is produced and hopefully today after we're through you'll get a little better feel for that uh, you know it's our responsibility to protect the resources we have you can see behind me uh, we've some of the terrain around here uh, a little hillier ground more for for livestock production than necessarily for road crop production and again uh, take care of the land take care of the animals so we can hopefully do an efficient job of raising beef for the consumer. So with that, uh, we're gonna move inside and uh, start talking in a little more detail. Awesome, thanks for the warm introduction there, John. It's great. Okay, before we get going too far, I, I wanna give you some background on beef cattle. You may or may not be familiar with some of these statistics and I just wanna provide you this to give you a little perspective about how important the beef industry is across the country. Uh, as of uh, January 1, and these numbers are probably still pretty consistent, there are approximately 31 million beef cows across the United States. Now, Ohio would be, cons and, and, and beef cows are in every state, including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, Hawaii wouldn't be a bad place to raise beef cattle, I would admit that. Um, <laughs> Ohio is what I would call a mid-level state, as far as numbers. Ohio has roughly 300,000 beef cows. Now, if you're familiar with the state, the bulk of the, the beef cows in this state are in Southern Ohio and Eastern Ohio. Uh, just draw an imaginary line kind of from Cincinnati up to Columbus and then angle over to Eastern Ohio, maybe a little bit uh, Northern of uh, I-70 and that would catch the bulk of beef cows in the state. Now, uh, we do have a slide that I'd like uh, the folks at uh, OCA to bring it up. It's a uh, it's a slide that kind of represents what the average cow herd in this country looks like. Uh, you see a bull and amongst some different cows that uh, are of different size and color. And that's very much uh, what you would see as you drive across the country. Now you will see individual herds that may be all black or you may see a herd of Herefords or Charolais, but a lot of the herds in this country uh, look like that. Now I did say Ohio has roughly 300,000 cows we have lots of small herds in this state. And when I say small, the average herd size in this state is 17 cows. And that's based off of US census data. Um, but the vast majority of these 31 million cows across the country and the ones we have here in Ohio 
are crossbred or not registered. Uh, we do here at this operation try to raise registered or purebred seed stock for other uh, producers. Uh, so we would be a little different in our mode of operation compared to other, and that's going to go into more details. We, we visit with you the rest of this hour. Uh, as far as the breeds that are most important uh, in this country, uh, there are dozens of breeds that uh, farmers and ranchers can use to produce beef. Uh, last I checked, I think it was approaching 80. Uh, some of them are very small niche type uh, breeds, but the, 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 the top five in terms of registrations, purebred cattle, uh, they're registered to raise seed stock for other breeders. Angus are far and away uh, the largest. They uh, register over 300,000 head annually. Uh, so basically all the cattle in Ohio would equate to the number of Angus registered every year in the population. Hereford are second, Red Angus are third, Simmental are fourth, and Charlay are fifth. And those five breeds would really make up the vast majority of the commercial cattle being produced today. There are some parts of the country, like in the Southern states where it's hot, that they need uh, some Brahma influence cattle with less hair, uh, more resistance to heat. And, and you will see those in the South, but you really won't see those here in the upper Midwest. Now, beef cattle do come in all shapes and sizes, and there's quite a bit of variation within each breed. And I'm gonna give you a wide range, but beef cows, in just normal pasture condition that you saw behind me as we started. Beef cows that can be on the small side may only weigh a thousand pounds. Really big beef cows can weigh upwards towards a ton and that's uh, quite large. Um, and then the size does dictate how much uh, feed they consume. But I would say the average cow walking around at, at most ranches or farms in this country are probably in the 13 to 1400 pound range. That's probably where they uh, would come in on average. Now bulls uh, will be bigger, uh, just the nature of the beast, so to speak. Uh, they're um, muscling and just uh, gender differences. They are a little bigger. Uh, bulls that are mature could weigh anywhere from 1500 to 2500 pounds. And I've seen bulls larger than that, uh, but they're, they're not the norm. So that gives you some kind of idea how big beef cattle can be. Now, uh, the next slide will show you a picture of a cow that just delivered a calf. And she's doing what she's supposed to do. She's cleaning the calf off. She's licking the calf off. And that's honestly one of the great things you can see on a farm is when a cow has a baby and how that maternal instinct kicks in and how the calf comes to its senses and has the wherewithal to get up and nurse. And that's one of the most fascinating things you can see on the farm. But that baby on average would be six to 7% of the cow's weight. So when a cow weighed 1200 pounds, you could see a 72 to 84 pound calf. That would be kind of typical. There again are extremes. Uh, you can have calves that weigh over hundred pounds. And generally as the bigger the calf gets, it's sometimes we can have uh, some delivery issues. So we, we do want to be uh, careful about that. Now, at some point in time in their life, we do wean the calves off their mothers. And on average, that would happen at about six to eight months of age. The calf, uh, say a calf was born in January, we'd wean that calf typically sometime between June and August, uh, six to eight months of age. And at that point, the, the, the mother's milk production is on decline. The calf's not getting a lot of nutrients from the mother, so it's time to wean the calf and provide some other type of nutrition to the calf. Now, when we talk about beef that is fed out and used for food production, uh, most of the beef in this country, whether it's uh, in a grass-fed situation or a traditional feedlot situation, I would say on average, most of those animals are harvested somewhere between 15 and 24 months of age. That would allow them to grow and develop properly and, and maximize their value as far as muscle and, and marbling in the carcass. So that's uh, some basic information about beef cattle production. I hope that uh, some of you have learned some of that if you're in FFA and some of your classrooms, but uh, just a quick background um, about the, the beef industry in this country. Again, as you would expect, probably the larger states are more out west. Uh, you know, obviously Texas would be the largest cow state. Uh, states such as Missouri, Oklahoma, Kansas, the Dakotas. Actually, the largest beef cattle state east of the Mississippi River, this is a bit of trivia for you folks, is the state of Kentucky. 
Kentucky is, uh, they're ranked eighth or ninth in the country on beef cows. There's quite a bit of cattle production in Kentucky. Okay, we're going to shift a little bit to management of the herd. And um, the next picture I want them to bring up would be a, just a, a normal pasture picture uh, with animals grazing and a white barn in the background. Really wouldn't be too terribly different uh, than what you would see as you drive around Ohio. Uh, you know, beef cows are nutrients, uh, are nutrients, excuse me, they're ruminants. They uh, have multiple stomachs. They can digest roughage that humans can. Humans are monogastrics. They have a single stomach. It's hard for us to break down cellulose and lots of fiber. And that's one of the beauties of, of beef cows is they can take forage that we normally can't consume as, cat, uh, as humans and turn it into a protein. And I, I think that's one of the, the big pluses of, of beef cattle. Uh, of course, dairy cattle can do the same thing, although their main purpose is for milk production, and they're just slightly different in their overall physiological makeup. Uh, but we would consider normal grazing time. It's a little bit like when you're mowing your yard. When you think about how many times you have to mow your yard during the year, uh, it kind of starts after winter break. Sometime in April, you'll have to start mowing your yard as, as the temperatures warm up. And then we're getting towards the end of the season now or maybe we cut that off sometime in November as we approach Thanksgiving. So what I would consider under normal conditions, normal weather patterns, uh, cattle can graze out on pasture and take care of themselves in a normal year where we have adequate rainfall, basically from the middle of April to about the 1st of December. Now, obviously some weather patterns will change that, snow, uh, drought, different things like that will change those numbers, but that's kind of what we budget for in a, in a given year. So we, we kind of assume we're going to have to come up with extra forage to feed them for at least four to five months during the late fall and through the winter. And uh, to me, that's our responsibility to, to be good stewards and take care of the animals and provide them uh, adequate feed. Um, we try to uh, actually, uh, if you would turn the camera and show them, we've got a couple bales, a different form of harvested forage uh, We've got the, the large round bales that you'll see often as you drive around the countryside. And then you'll see one of the small square bales in front. And we, we make some of both. The vast majority of the hay or forage that we make is in the large round bale form. It's just more efficient. We don't need as much labor. When you make the small bales of hay, you have to have more labor to put it in the barn. So uh, we usually do that, some of that for, for either calving season when we have cows in or uh, for animals that we're showing. So uh, just wanted to give you a little perspective of that. Uh, we do try to group our animals by age and production group. And what I mean by that, we try not to let our young cattle fight with the mature cattle for feed. Uh, we try to group them by size. So it's a more uniform group and they can uh, be fed the proper diet to match them at their stage of production, whether a yearling or a mature cow, or say it's a cow that's nursing a calf or a cow that's in mid gestation all those need to be fed differently so we try to divide them up by production group and that allows us to do a better job of feeding and taking care of the animals for the year um, herd health is very important and uh, you know there's always discussion in the press about uh, are we being responsible with medications are we uh following labels and, and I want to show you a few just examples of, of medicines we use I guess big picture type things uh, we believe in preventive maintenance before uh, letting things get out of hand and something getting sick so we tr try to do responsible use of medicine but we try to prevent an illness before it can show up now uh, best intentions don't always work sometimes the weather is harsh uh, you guys think about normal Ohio weather in February March and April you know, days it's raining and 30, 35 degrees. Think about how you feel if your coat gets wet and you're standing outside in the wind and it's 30 to 35 degrees, you get chilled. So they, they are more at risk for sickness in those kind of conditions. Actually, it's not as harsh on them when it's cold and dry. Say it's 10 degrees and no precipitation, I'd take that any day before 35 and rain because it's just more stress on the animal. So uh, I guess I would share with you here that uh, when we do herd health maintenance, and again, trying to do preventive type stuff, uh, we have a regimen for newborn calves. Uh, when calves are born, like that picture we showed you earlier, uh, 
uh, we treat them with, with some different products. Basically, the two things that we're giving them are to prevent respiratory issues like pneumonia. Uh, and we also give them some boosters on vitamins like vitamin A and D and selenium. Ohio is a state that is known to be deficient in selenium. So we do give every newborn calf a, a supplemental shot of selenium uh, and vitamins A and D to kind of get them off to a good start. And something I don't have to show you, but uh, I can't emphasize enough is Mother Nature's very good about trying to help us. Um, the term colostrum or, or mother's first milk, and it applies to humans, it applies to livestock. It's so important for that newborn calf to get up and nurse that cow. And most of the times they will. I mean, there are exceptions. Sometimes uh, uh, the mother isn't ready for this to happen and she doesn't let the calf nurse or the calf uh, uh, maybe is a little slow to pick up its instincts. Um, if they don't do it on their own, we try to supplement them. And it's really important that they get some form of colostrum in their belly in the first six hours of their life uh, because that sets that animal up for immunity. It has antibodies in the, the colostrum that helps prepare the calf for the stresses it's coming uh, for whatever time of year it's born. So colostrum is something that's a natural product uh, the cow provides. If for some reason the cow and the calf don't get hooked up or the cow doesn't have enough milk, there are supplements that we can use to, to add to the calf, either through them nursing a bottle or through a drench that we can get to some of those antibodies in their system. Now, as they get older, uh, you know, it's a, a lot like uh, humans in the fact that Sometimes us old folks are, are a little more resistant to some things than so a, a new child or a, or a teenager or something like that. So uh, we still worry about uh, respiratory issues kind of through their whole life because they do have a, a beef cows are raised generally out in the open. They're not confined in a building like hogs or, or chickens. So uh, they're a little more uh, sus suspect to swings in environmental conditions. So uh, we try to give them shots to prevent respiratory issues. Um, and we also worry about internal and external parasites like lice, ringworm, things like that. Uh, uh, worms or things like that in their digestive system. They are grazing animals, so that occasionally they'll pick up some, some pests through natural grazing practices. So we, we try to help them along the way and provide some, uh, some medication uh, when appropriate. Uh, I don't want you guys to think that we're just uh, overdosing them. Uh, we've got these these different medicines here, and I don't know Hannah, if you can get closer, I can hold up, but you know, this is just a brand. It's an antibiotic, uh, and it's got very explicit instructions on the label. Tells us how much to use based on what the animal weighs, so many cc's per, 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 per hundred pounds, and if we're going to harvest this animal for meat, when we cannot give this product. So I guess the way I look at it, if you're responsible and you fought, and this, this product had to be blessed by the Food and Drug Administration. So uh, there was research had done, it showed that, that if how it was used properly, it would be safe for the animal and safe for human consumption. So uh, this is kind of the law, we have to follow it. And the only person that can go against this recommendation is a veterinarian. Uh, the veterinarian through their professional training can make a different recommendation based on their research and, and scientific knowledge. But me as a producer, we can't go off label, but the vet can in certain circumstances. So um, that's just an example. We've got different, you know, that's an antibiotic. This is also an antibiotic. And this is one of those vitamin supplements, vitamin A and D. Now, some of the products require different dosages. So we've got three different size syringes here uh, that we use. We've got the, uh, uh, a three cc syringe, we've got a six cc syringe, and then we have a 12. Now I didn't bring them all out here, but we've got 30 and 60 cc syringes as well. So a lot of times, you know, a, a small calf won't use very much of this drug, but you get into a, a mature cow that weighs 13 or 1400 pounds, she might get 40 or 50 cc's of it. And that's why I think, uh, uh, keep in mind, it's all on a per pound basis. It's not uh, on a per head basis. So we, uh, we have scales and we kind of know what these animals weigh. So we are trying to make an appropriate dosage. Also, some of the medications have very explicit instructions on what type of needle to use, what gauge, what length, 
you know, whether we give the shot what they call subcutaneous, just under the skin. Um, just imagine my shirt's the outer skin. We, we go under the skin, be subcutaneous, or we go intramuscular, where we go straight into the muscle. So there's these kind of instructions on every label. And uh, it's our job to do that. Generally, if it's an intramuscular or subcutaneous, most of the shots are given in the neck uh, because that's mostly some of the less valuable cuts of the animal as far as meat production. Uh, the most valuable cuts are in the back. That's where steaks are at. So we uh, do no vaccinations in their back, their loin. Uh, some, some people do uh, shots in their hind quarter, but generally the recommended spot for medication is in the neck. So we try to try to adhere to that. Great, John, I have a question here, if you're ready. Yes, yes. So are antibiotics only used when an illness is present and are the sick animals isolated then from the herd? Uh, the, the real answer is it depends. Uh, the severity, if it's a, if you catch an animal that's just starting, a lot of times we don't isolate it. Now if an animal's really sick, yes, we do try to isolate it. Um, you know, most farms, uh, I know you, you think about a hospital or a, a place that we can isolate. We, okay, with the virus, we're talking about quarantining. Uh, a lot of farms don't have unlimited space. So sometimes it's hard. So I would say it just depends on the, the particular ranch or farm, uh, what their facilities are like. We're fortunate. Uh, we are on, we have some different farms that we could maybe relocate an animal, take it to a different spot. So it's not putting as many animals t uh, at risk. Now, um, the whole subject about antibiotics, it comes up uh, whether we're given on an as needed basis or routinely every day. And I would say the only time that uh, we are feeding an antibiotic to an animal is like at weaning when they're under a lot of stress. You know, they're, they've left their mother, they're, they're changing from a milk-based diet to a grain-fed diet. So to me, that's a, a kind of a high risk time in their life. So just while they're bawling and stressed out over leaving their mother, we do supplement with some antibiotics just to get them through that high stress period. And then once they get over that, we uh, take them off that. So I hope that answers uh, the question. Great. Awesome. Yeah. I think we're looking here. You have about 20 minutes left just kind of for your time's sake. Okay. Let's keep going here. Uh, uh, before we get into genetics, I want to talk about some basics about reproduction. Uh, beef cattle uh, uh, typically reach puberty uh, at, at uh, 12 months of age. It does vary by breed and size of the animal, but that's uh, a, a a pretty steady number for a lot of breeds. Uh, I think our next slide, uh, we're going to show you a, a picture of when a cow is receptive to breed. Uh, that's uh, called standing heat or um, estrus, E-S-T-R-O-U-S is the actual scientific term. What you're seeing on the slide is basically what happens every 18 to 21 days if they're not bred. Uh, basically, the, the cycle will repeat, and uh, when they're bred, either by a bull or artificially, uh, that, I won't get into too much detail, but that basically sends some hormonal signals to shut that process off. So uh, that would happen basically every 21 days unless they're bred. So uh, that process would start when they're uh, roughly 12 months of age. Uh, our goal is to give our virgin heifers uh, at approximately two years of age. That's a nice balance between when they've reached physiological maturity and uh, can normally take care of a calf. Uh, gestation length, how long it takes for a calf to conceive to be born is 283 days, give or take one or two days. So it's similar to humans. Uh, our next slide is to, to let you know some of the science we use. Uh, we try to use technology uh, to, I'm going to step over here and watch what you're seeing, is uh, some of the technology we have available. Uh, that is, again, the picture of, uh, of the estrus cycles. Basically, they'll stay in for 12 to 18 hours, and uh, uh, we try to get them bred uh, and, and try to keep it a relatively short breeding season, 60 to 75 days, uh, just for management reasons. But we do want to determine pregnancy status. Uh, that is actually a picture of ultrasound, you can see actually a baby calf there in that ultrasound 
uh, picture, that's probably about a 40 or 50 day fetus inside a cow. And it's very much the same equipment uh, that you uh, see at a doctor's office. That's the same kind of monitor uh, that you would see. Uh, we can all just do blood tests. Uh, show a picture here of taking blood from the tail. And uh, we'll talk about how we use that in other, other ways, but you can send that off to a lab. They can check for hormone levels. And in less than two days, I'll know whether that cow is, is open or, or bred. So that uh, uh, we didn't have the picture of what I would call a traditional vet palpating a cow, but there's basically three ways, traditional rectal palpation, ultrasound or blood testing. And uh, unfortunately not enough producers do it. Uh, it's, it's a good management tool to decide how to handle the herd. If they're pregnant, they need to be fed a certain way. If they're, they're not, uh, you need to do something different. As I said, heifers will KF typically at two years of age. Most females will stay productive up to about 10 years of age. And after they get into double digits, uh, as far as age, just like uh, humans, things start happening. Uh, uh, maybe fertility drops off, accidents happen, broken bones, things like that. Probably the biggest thing as animals get older is actually their teeth wear out uh, from grazing and eating feed over the years. So a lot of times you'll see a 10, 11, 12 year old cow starting to get thin. And if you open up her mouth, her teeth aren't as intact as they were and she can't process and digest food. So that's, that's something that a good steward will be checking their animals to see how that kind of thing uh, goes along. Uh, we can uh, breed females different ways. Uh, we can use the bull. That's the old fashioned way, let mother nature do the, the course. We, uh, we can use artificial insemination where the, the a technician or a person can actually put the bull semen in uh, a cow. This is just a straw of semen that uh, would have somewhere in the 15 to 20 million sperm cells. And this little, looks like a drink stir, stir stick. Uh, and just for our information, it has the name of the bull and some, some registration information. We store this in one of these semen tanks. It's a liquid nitrogen tank that uh, keeps it frozen. This straw is already being unthawed, usually unthawed at about 95 degree water for about a minute. And we take it, put it in this gun, and then uh, the person would breed the cow uh, with a glove on and, and thread this rod through their uterus and place the semen in the right spot. We also do embryo transfer. And this is a picture, it's a little different uh, lineup, but the, this, this straw contains one beef embryo. You can't see it with the naked eye, but uh, actually the information's on this uh, tab on the end on what the maiden is. And uh, we use that to maybe get out of some of our um, it's kind of the, the foster mother concept. We'll take uh, an egg out of a donor female and put it in another cow. And uh, we try to try to uh, capitalize on our good genetics that way. We try to get more animals. Actually, it's gotten much more sophisticated than that. Uh, we take one step farther and do IVF, in vitro fertilization as well. Just like humans, uh, we can take uh, oocytes off the ovaries of a cow, put them in a Petri dish, and for seven days, we can actually fertilize them in the Petri dish and in seven days, develop the embryo in another environment, then take it and putting it in, into the foster cow. So uh, that's some of the technology we use in reproduction to try to produce uh, uh, more and better cattle. Um, so I've hopefully skimmed over some of the important things uh, uh, far as uh, far as reproduction. So we get into more genetics. Um, as far as to wrap up this thing today, I want to spend the last part of our program on uh, genetics and what we do to try to raise better cattle. Uh, I would say, at least in this operation, for, I don't think we're much different than other seed stock producers. The two most important traits to us are fertility and calving ease. We got to get a cow bred and then we have to have a live calf. So it doesn't matter if they're Angus, Hereford, Charlay, whatever. If you don't get fertility and get a, a fetus conceived and then get a live calf delivered, the rest of it really doesn't matter. So if we get those two things conquered, we're on, a, on, a, on our way. Uh, but far as uh, important traits to the producer, growth, obviously we sell cattle by the pound. So weaning weight, yearling weight, things like that are important. 
we do want the females to be additions to the herd. So they need to have a, a structural soundness and integrity that they can last a long time on, on pasture. They have to have maternal instincts. They have to have a good udder so the calf can get up and nurse. And then ultimately what's really important to us is carcass traits, so what the end product is for the consumer. Uh, Angus breed is known for that and that's why we, we raise that, that breed. Uh, you've probably heard of the brand Certified Angus Beef. It's, it's uh, well received by the consumers. It was the first uh, branded beef program. It was established uh, over 40 years ago here in Ohio. And I'm, so I'm partial to it. Uh, one of the, the founding fathers that actually developed the standards was a professor at Ohio State, Dr. Bobby Van Stavern. And uh, so CAB headquarters are at Wooster. But uh, last year, to tell you what the consumer wants, last year, certified Angus beef sold over 1.25 billion pounds of beef. And it's high quality beef. It's average choice or higher, to, average choice to prime, and the consumers like it. It's, it's more palatable, has more flavor, and that's why it's so popular. Uh, but far as to identify the good cattle, we collected a lot of data. We, we take lots of measurements and weights on these animals, such as birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight. Uh, that ultrasound machine you saw earlier uh, will actually measure carcass traits at a year of age. We don't have to harvest them, so we'll measure their ribeye. We'll see how much marbling they have uh, so we can identify the superior animals. A part of this is identification. Uh, we, we try to tag and tattoo every animal. They are assigned a, a number in the herd. So what this, this tag shows, the animal's number is 9051. The top numbers, it's, it's daddy. The bottom numbers, it's, it's mother. And what this tag number tells me, it was the 51st calf born in 2019. That's our numbering system. Same thing for the Simmentals. The Angus are green tags, the Simmentals are red tags here. They use a letter system. So the letter G indicates it was born in 2019, but we do the same thing. First calf born in 2019, sire, damn. So that's how we do that. Now, another bit of technology that's out there is electronic ID. We have these 15-digit uh, 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 government-issued tags that have a radio chip in here. And uh, it's actually uh, a big plus in commerce if animals are moving through the system. Like for tattoo, sometimes tags get lost. These get lost too. But if you're traveling or whatever, somebody can stand with one of these wands. This is the same technology you'd have at a grocery store when you scan a product and they read a bar. There's actually a barcode in this chip and they just read it. And I can take this information, download it to my computer, pass it on. So instead of having notebook paper all the time, we can electronically transfer information. Okay. So I told you we collect a lot of data. And the reason we do, we have some really important decisions to make about this animal uh, as, as it progresses through life. Uh, from the day it's born uh, till the time it becomes a parent, whether it's a male or female, we have to make some decisions where they have the merit to stay in the herd or they become an animal that goes into the food chain. And we try to keep the genetically superior animals and we do that through data collection. And we also do it uh, uh, for, for uh, different uh, things. I wanted to show you a picture of a bull that we own, uh, the uh, bull called Keneally Emerald. I don't know if that picture's up yet or not. Uh, he's a bull that's actually an AI stud. That bull is used by breeders across the country actually uh, we're in an ownership group on this bull. Uh, the, the people that own it, there's two of us from Ohio. There's a ranch in Montana and a ranch in California. And then he is also partially owned by an AI stud or a bull stud that sells semen. So that bull will have progeny scattered all over the country. Uh, it, he does today and hopefully he will for a longer time. Uh, but that bull was identified in a herd in Nebraska that we thought he was a genetically superior animal that would help us raise higher quality animals. Now, with all this data we're talking about collected, what's the indication to you or how can you uh, interpret how good this animal is? So the next slide is a, is a copy of a registration paper from the Angus Association. And if you see it, uh, I'll come around there and I'll try to describe some of it to you. So if you see uh, this in a sale catalog or on the internet, so you see the bull's name, it's got his registration, uh, if you look up there under birth date, it tells you how old he is. 
tattoo. And then you start seeing some of the fine print, parentage, uh, genomic, and how many progeny. This was taken last spring. So he just had started having calves. But uh, basically what this tells me, he's been verified that this pedigree is right when it says SNP parentage and then which genomic test he was scored under. So, and it also said that the date I printed this, which was back in March, uh, he'd actually had two calves that had DNA tests taken on him. So now we look at the pedigree, you can look at the information of that. It's, it's a, uh, lack of a better term, it's kind of a 20, was it 23 and Me is the, the genetic family tree. Well, that's what you're looking at right here. And you see all these small boxes. The, these are the genetic indicators of this animal. And I'm not gonna read all through all of these, but you've got like CED, that's a measure of calving ease, BW is birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, on down the line. Um, you get to the bottom here, CW is carcass weight, marbling, RE is ribeye, fat. There's a wealth of information here. And the thing I want you to, to interpret here is okay, if you look at these boxes and you can see them real close, the second number down, it's a two digit number. It's a decimal point then like 0 0.40, 0 0.58. That's a statistical measure about how accurate it is. You're never gonna see a 1.0, but a, the most proven animal in the world would be a 0.99. So what uh, these numbers tell you is how much data has come in. And, and uh, then the third number down where it says percent, that's actually its percentile rank. So. I'll give you another example that you older students can relate to. If you've taken the ACT test, if you tell me that you've got a 30 on the ACT test, that tells me you're pretty smart, but it doesn't tell me how smart. And that's what the percentile ranks are. It tells me that the emerald is in the top 15% of the breed for calving ease, 15% uh, for birth weight, weaning weight, top 10% for yearling weight. Um, where he's really elite is ribeye down at the bottom, muscle he's in the top 1%. So I can use this information and uh, make breeding decisions based on how his, his pedigree is, and what his EPDs are. Now, EPDs are what they call expected progeny differences. And uh, we take a lot of information to create that number. Uh, it's basically a number that predicts the future performance of that animal in that given trait. And um, EPDs are generated from the pedigree, what the parent's her heritage is, uh, from that animal's individual performance, how much they weigh and all that, and uh, uh, the progeny of the animal and actually DNA. Now, DNA came on about 2010. We've been using DNA to identify superior animals for the last 10 years. And just like any technology, it was very expensive when we started. I think back in 2010 or 11, the first uh, DNA test we did was like $125. It was very expensive. Now, over time, as we got more competition and, and better technology, a basic panel to, to measure 15 different traits costs $37. So it's come down quite a bit, almost uh, $90 in a, in a decade. So more people are doing it. The Angus breed in the next year will probably hit 1 million animals that have had a DNA test done on them. So that's pretty, uh, pretty big change over time. As we start to wrap up here, uh, you know, I think uh, genomics are gonna to continue to play a big part uh, in what we do. Um, the thing it has proven to us is, you know, we all are a product of our parents, okay? But we're not equal parts of our parent, parents. You know, if we, we were, all siblings would kind of look the same and act the same. And that's just not the case. Inheritance happens in different ways. You've seen brothers or sisters, one may look more like their dad, one may look more like their mom. There's, it's, not to get too scientific, but it's called independent assortment of chromosomes. You know, they, there's all these combinations and it's not symmetrical. It's not 50-50. Sometimes the male dominates, sometimes the female dominates. So uh, that's what DNA does for us. It helps us identify that at an earlier age. Um, it provides more data then, okay, if I take an animal and weigh it, I know something about that animal in one day in its life. If you do a DNA profile, you know what's in its genes for its whole life. So on those, all those different traits you saw on the, that registration paper of, of Emerald, uh, a DNA test can give you what they call progeny equivalents. Uh, and depending on the trait, how easily in, inherited that trait is, like uh, uh, carcass traits are highly heritable, like muscle and marbling. Uh, those uh, 
progeny equivalents will be different than say milk or, wean or, or weaning weight. So uh, one DNA test can give you over a lifetime of information. Uh, the range in our DNA test today on the various traits is anywhere from nine to 36 head. There's no way a cow is going to naturally have 36 calves in their life. Very few of them have nine. So we get a wealth of information really quick. I want to wrap up if I can get uh, some cooperation. If uh, we have an actor back here that maybe can help us. What, what I'm trying to get to here is about a 10 day old calf. And this calf um, is actually an embryo transfer calf. He, he had a foster mother. And uh, so, you know, we, we know something about his pedigree. We, we know uh, what he's bred to be. He's got a ways to go. Hopefully he has a long, long productive life, but I can take a blood sample on this calf. It takes about three weeks from the lab to get the results back. And I can learn more in a month by the time he's a month old than he would in a lifetime. And that's what technology does for us. So actually that's kind of what I've got today. I hope you have, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them or, or not, yes. but uh, this, is, uh, this is our little role model today. Awesome, yes, we do have some questions actually. So that's great. Um, this is a question from Tanya Prombo. Um, if you are utilizing artificial insemination, do you collect your own specimens or do you get them from a source? A source, uh, it's uh, a pretty involved process. It's, it can be uh, uh, the physical requirements to handle a large mature bull is probably not easily done at a farm. So usually a bull, uh, Emerald is at a bull stud. Actually, he's in Ohio. He's at Tiffin, Ohio at a, at a bull stud at Tiffin. And they collect him there once or twice a week and they'll freeze it and create inventory and then scatter it out across the country. But it's typically done at a commercial facility. So, and then it kind of goes on. So is this means of breeding the most successful? And do you still turn a bull out into the pasture with a group of heifers after the process occurs? Uh, the latter, we typically will artificial breed a female twice. We'll give them two shots to get bred artificial, you know, 21 days apart. So uh, I said, we try to keep our breeding season at 60 to 75 days. If we breed them on day one, if they come back in heat 21 days later, two shots is enough to try to breed them artificial. Then we'll turn a bull out and let the bull uh, hopefully do the job that we couldn't get done artificially. Great. And then just a couple other questions um, that came in prior to the tour. Um, there are a lot of people that, you know, might want to make this a career or start their own herd. Can you provide some insight on what careers options they have or any tips you have for starting your own herd? Well, as with anything in agriculture, starting your own herd from scratch is very difficult. You know, anything with agriculture is is capital intensive between land and barns and things like that. So I'm not saying you have to be born into it, but it makes it easier if you're a family uh, that has a heritage of raising them. Uh, you can, it can be done. You can uh, maybe hook up with somebody that's ready to retire and do some type of a buyout program with them. But as far as jobs, uh, you know, my oldest daughter, Lindsay, when she graduated, after she got her master's, she uh, went to work for a, a feed company. She was basically an educator for a vitamin and mineral company. And she did programs around the country. She basically did what I did as an extension uh, professional uh, educating farmers. Uh, there's uh, in finance, sales, uh, whether it's uh, agronomics, uh, you know, several people that I went to college with work in livestock marketing, uh, managed stockyards, things like that. Uh, there are some folks that actually manage other ranches. You may not own the ranch, but you get to manage it. Uh, there's there's uh, a place for that kind of thing. So, you know, talk to your guidance counselors, uh, with, both on the high school and college level. There's, there's careers out there. Uh, you know, food production, uh, you think about the whole process from the farm to the table and anybody that touches the food, whether it's a grocery store manager or a meat packer or a salesman, there's opportunities. It's just uh, find your niche, what you really like. Great. And then can you just talk very briefly on what you're standing beside and has been the backdrop of you the entire time? 
this is a shoot that, uh, okay, imagine this guy is a lot bigger. I talked about, you know, 12, 13, 1400 pound cows. This is where we put the animal in to restrain them. We'll catch them uh, behind their head so they're stabilized. And this is like, if we're given shots that we can go into the side and treat them in the neck, like I talked about most vaccinations. And, uh, you know, if we have to do anything else, treat them for something. This is for the safety of the animal and for the safety of the, the producer. Great. That is awesome. Well, thank you so much today, John. I'm sure everyone is leaving with a little bit more information than when we started. So I really appreciate that. And again, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for participating and joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.